That's good. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to this uh, very uh, important and interesting panel on Hong Kong. Let me begin by repeating what I have said on many occasions. There are three most important jobs in the world. One is making peace in the Middle East. Two is democratizing China. The three, losing weight. <laughs> So probably, unfortunately, it remains true, will remain true for many years to come. When we come to China, we know China is such a huge country. It's just an elephant in your living room. You cannot ignore it. But sadly to say, this country is a great country that we love with great potential, but has fundamental problems. It gives the world a lot of troubles. Tibetan issue is China's problem. Um, North Korea situation has a lot to do with China, not let alone Hong Kong, of course. Many people talk about a prerequisite for democratization in a country. They cite economic, uh, culture, education, income, all these factors. By all counts, Hong Kong satisfied the conditions. But why not Hong Kong? So we all know, we all watched, as Hong Kong students staged a 79 protest last year, asking for uh, the very right to choose their own leader, which is um, promised by Chinese government as well, but why? So we saw these two uh, young leaders in, on street, um, in the conference room, across the table with um, uh, government representatives in the dialogue, the only dialogue with the uh, government during the 79 days. So we are very, very lucky to have these two young leaders to be with us today, and we see hope in this generation and Alex Chow is the um, uh, Secretary General of Hong Kong Federation for Students. And um, Alastair Shum is the Deputy uh, Secretary General. They both play a key role in the protest. Uh, without much uh, ado, uh, I give a floor to these two. They will, you know, talk about uh, what the reason, what happened, and what is going to happen. Now, I give you. Is it? Let's see. Let's see if it works. Okay. Well, uh, okay. Testing, testing. All right. Okay, uh, good afternoon. So I'm Alex, and here's Lester. We are uh, both undergraduate students in, back in Hong Kong. Uh, so I guess today, well, uh, my friends here, well, well you have uh, listened to well, different stories, different sharing uh, from different countries, and most of you must have been inspired by some of the stories. Uh, those stories, I bet most of them uh, carry on with uh, hope, sometimes uh, tragedy. I guess Hong Kong's story, Hong Kong's case, will share the same. Um, so I will share the PowerPoint with Lester all together uh, in illustrating Hong Kong's situation and problem. I guess when people, they are concerned about Hong Kong, uh, in some sense, they are also concerned about China because uh, people will feel like, well, right now, China is the greatest or the second uh, uh, largest economy in the world. So her step or her decision or her future will definitely affect the world. And Hong Kong, uh, as a place within mainland China or uh, under the rule of China, well, uh, she would absolutely also affect China. And this part, when you look at the words that in Chinese, Meng Wan Zi Zhi, it means that to seize our future. Um, this slogan is proposed by the students well, uh, 
last year when we initiate a student strike in September. So why this is important, uh, we're going to illustrate it in the PowerPoint. Uh, I don't know whether you guys have seen well, this since last year. This one and this one. Actually, there are uh, some major role in Hong Kong, but last year uh, they were blocked by uh, thousands of citizens in Hong Kong. And the reason for being this is because the government used tear gas to eliminate people on the street. But why this happened? Well, maybe we have to trace back to uh, 30 years. And 30 years before, uh, there was a boy called Benny Tai. And look at this handsome young man, Benny Tai. 30 years later, uh, also Benny Tai. So 30 years before, when it was in the 80s, uh, Benny Tai was a law student uh, studying at uh, University for Hong Kong. And 30 years later, well, he became the law professor, also in the Faculty of Law, University of Hong Kong. But by the time, he was already at the proposal of the Occupy Central with Love and Peace campaign. So here comes the question. How a city propelled a young, handsome gentleman became a professor that would ask people to go on the street and demonstrate? How would this happen? And this is what we have faced uh, in the past three decades in Hong Kong. In the 80s, um, actually after the Second World War, uh, the British government, they took over Hong Kong again. And in the 70s, uh, the colonial government, they start to think about different reform. Why they initiate reform is because, well, they know that uh, when it came to the 80s and the 90s, the Chinese government will ask to take back Hong Kong. So in order to increase the bargaining power uh, at hand of British government, they start different reform in the 70s. And when it came to the 80s, uh, the British government and the Chinese government, they start to negotiate. Uh, what would be the future of Hong Kong? And by 1984, there was a Sino-British Joint Declaration signed. But by the time, well, there was no role for Hong Kong people. It was only a deal made by the British government and the uh, Chinese government. Actually, what was signed or promised in the Sino-British Joint Declaration, it's uh, list in this way. The chief executive will be appointed by the central people's government on the basis of the results of election or consultation to be held locally. That means that uh, when they signed this uh, joint declaration in the 80s, the Chinese government made an international promise that Hong Kong people would gain universal suffrage after 1997. And that was the promise made by the Chinese government and also the British government in the 80s. But as we all know, well, the promise didn't really come true. And um, time flies. And in 1989, well, by the time some of the Hong Kong people, well, they, are also, uh, they were also looking forward to uh, the future of Hong Kong. Well, uh, they, they, some of them might have hope after 1997, because uh, in the mid-80s, in the late uh, 80s, uh, the Chinese government or China, they're having different kind of reform, economic reform, political reform. But by the time on 1989, uh, there was a thing happened, and that was called Tiananmen uh, massacre or the 1989 student movement and maybe most of you us will know that well uh, this movement it actually stopped the progress of democratic reform in China and the picture here was when uh, in Hong Kong students and citizens they went on the street to protest and to support China And every year, there will be a vigil held in Victoria Park in Hong Kong. Thousands of people would gather there. But this kinds of effort didn't really help Hong Kong to gain democracy. 
Uh, after 1989, uh, actually most of the Hong Kong people, well, they are kind of uh, indifferent to the situation because there's full of uncertainty, full of tension. They don't know whether the Chinese government will collapse after 1989, and they are kind of uh, unsure that uh, what would also happen after 1997. So by the time in the 90s, there was a lot of different commentary saying that, well, Hong Kong might die after 1997, and there will be a new guide in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong will be different again. There will no longer be an economic city, well, uh, as influential as before. And when 1997 came, actually, uh, most of the Hong Kong people, well, they're kind of uh, unwilling to accept such a truth. And some of my friends, well, uh, in an older age, they even cried when 1997 came. Yeah, okay. Here comes the 1997 of the handover of Hong Kong to the China government. Many people was wondering whether the China government will fulfill or will keep the promise which is signed in the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the basic law that Hong Kong people is protected by the one country, two system with a um, separate law system. Uh, Hong Kong can enjoy the rights of rule of law and then the Hong Kong people can exercise the rights of a high autonomy on the local issues in Hong Kong. Many people wonder where the China government will keep this promise in 1997. However, we look back on the history in these days and then we will find out that actually the Chinese government had no intention to keep their promise on the one country, two system and, uh, and the promise that Hong Kong people can exercise their right on the high autonomy. The reason, the main reason is because that we believe that this is an ideological war between the Chinese government and the Western countries. Um, during the colonial times, Hong Kong people was governed and ruled by the um, British people, the British government, and then they cultivated a culture or they cultivated a mindset that um, there's, there's so-called some Western ideologic, ideologies in Hong Kong, such as freedom, justice, equality, liberal democracy and the rule of law. And this is contradict to what Chinese government believe or they, the Chinese government just um, treat, treat these ideologies, freedom, justice, democracy, rule of law, as a threat to, to the regime in China or to the threat um, to the ruling in the China. So that they actually have a so-called cold, cold war mindset um, in the Hong Kong issue because um, they do not believe that. But Hong Kong people um, truly believe uh, what they call the Western ideologies, freedom, justice, equality, liberal democracy, and rule of law. So that the issue in Hong Kong is just uh, a war between reflect or reflecting the fact that um, the China might say that it is a war between Chinese, the China, and the Western countries, including the USA, including the um, UK, and including other Western countries. And Hong Kong's situation is always unique. Unlike Macau, um, a place beside Hong Kong and beside China, also, uh, also it was a colonial place by Portugal. Um, Macau um, is very trust, very trust by the Chinese government because Macau lacks dissidents or lack rebellion movements in Macau. However, Hong Kong, uh, a city or a cosmopolitan city which is occupied by the so-called hostile values um, ruled by the Chinese government, liberal democracy, rule of law, justice, fairness, and freedom is never trusted by the Chinese government. So that, as a result, um, the Chinese government proposed um, series of, a series of interventions and methods to control and to mold the environment or what people think in Hong Kong. The most direct way to control Hong Kong and to mold Hong Kong must be the political system. Um, as Dr. Yang said, we cannot choose our own leader. We cannot choose our own chief executive. The chief executive is chosen by a so-called nominating committee, a election committee formed by a group of um, 800 or 1,200 people, um, which are totally um, controlled by the pro-Beijing parties and uh, 
um, local tycoons, for example, the land tycoons, for example, the estate tycoons. Um, these tycoons or this rich guy have a very tight or very close relationship with the Chinese government, and they are totally controlled by the Chinese government on the political issue. And then not to mention the um, Legislative Council. Um, Hong Kong is a very special or a very strange place that um, the Legislative Council, half of our legis Legislative Councillors are elected directly by people. However, the other, of, the other half of them is what we so-called the functional constituency. They are also formed or elected by a small circle election. Only a small group or a, a certain group of people can choose the Legislative Council. As a result, um, as the Legislative Councils and the um, Chief Executive are also um, totally controlled by the government, there's a series of problems um, raised in Hong Kong. For example, the housing problems, for example, um, the uh, homeless, many homeless people in Hong Kong, for example, the, um, land, monopoly, the land monopoly issue, um, the land and the rates is totally monopolized or controlled by those rich guys because of the strange election system or political system. And that's, not, that's only the part of um, what China want to control the um, Hong Kong place. And then on the other hand, they um, launched a series of interventions. For example, um, on 2003, um, the Chinese government want to pass a law What is this, that is so-called um, the basic law, Article 23, um, it is about um, national protecting and national security in Hong Kong. We believe that this Article 23 of basic law infringe our freedom of speech, our freedom to assembly, our freedom to os oppose to our own government. We will be imprisoned like Dr. Yang or like um, uh, Liu Xiaobo or Ai Weiwei in China because we say something against the government. So that many Hong Kong people and 500,000 people come to the street and come to a demonstration. And this is a turning point of Hong Kong. The 50, this um, 500,000 people come to the street to demonstrate a so-called uh, paradigm shift. It is also a process of decolonization in Hong Kong. In the colonial period, um, the Hong Kong people only care about wealth, only care about money, only care about um, their materials. It's very materialistic. They will not care about the future. They will not stand up to fight for their own place, for their home, for Hong Kong. But in 2003, they come out and demonstrate and against the law of um, Hong Kong, and then they're against the law of um, Article 23 of the Basic Law, so that um, it succeeded. The government withdraw the proposal of um, Article 23 of Basic Law. This is the first victory by um, social movement, um, which is um, initiated or joined by 500,000 of Hong Kong citizens to fight their own future. This is a, and this is a very important paradigm shift in Hong Kong. That's, in, that's influenced the um, ongoing um, development in Hong Kong, and we believe that it caused and it it caused the umbrella movement um, in some certain ways or some certain factors. Okay, uh, so time is limited, so uh, we have to speak up. So uh, as Lester mentioned, there are lots of uh, social problems happening in Hong Kong, housing problem, uh, property gap, and, 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 and the government, they will also have different uh, policies so as to uh, seek to brainwash students as the, uh, the national education in incident. So every time when there were problems coming out, uh, their social movement. And throughout about three decades, uh, people finally realized that uh, we could not only abide to the practice or the struggle that we have been using in the past 30 years, because uh, in the current situation, uh, the practice that we have been using in the past three decades, well, it could no longer sway the government. So. Actually, well, last year or two years before, uh, uh, ago, well, Benny Tai, they proposed a new idea of struggling, that is civil disobedience. Well, uh, they are, they sh uh, he's asking people uh, to sacrifice more uh, so as to awaken more people, and that's the origin of how Occupy came to Hong Kong. Uh, 
And students also played a part in it, uh, so as to counter the uh, colonial legacy to eliminate well, the, 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 the political system inherited uh, before 1997. And so in September, in uh, late, uh, uh, late uh, August, well, the Chinese government actually, well, they smashed the hope for political reform in Hong Kong because in late August, uh, they had a meeting, uh, making a decision that uh, uh, there would be no authentic democratic reform in Hong Kong. Uh, the chief executive election, actually, well, the, the right to nominate, uh, it will be only restricted to 1,200 people. Uh, that is the, nom the member of the nominating committee. So in that sense, well, students feel like, well, they have to stand up. And that's how uh, student strike came in September. And so from this, you could see that, well, uh, student strikes, uh, it it simply well started in uh, CUHK, one of the university in Hong Kong. Then uh, Susan moved to Tama Park, a park near the headquarters of the government. But after uh, uh, five days of uh, demonstration, student strike, the government still didn't have any response. And that's why at the last day of the student strike, the students, well, they made a strike to Civil Square. So for Civil Square was actually a public uh, place uh, 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 in front of the headquarters of the government. Well, the act of having a strike to civil square is simply about to accelerate uh, the speed of occupying central. And it is also how this strike, uh, in turn, triggered the government starting to throw tear gas on the street. Because when students, they are trapped in civil square, uh, they were trapped for more than a half day, and those students who got arrested, they, they were uh, locked in the police station for almost uh, more than 40 hours. And by the time citizens, or uh, Hong Kong citizens, they simply surrounded the headquarters of the government. And because the government, or the, by the time uh, CY Learn, the chief executive executive of the SL government. Uh, they were so scared or they were, uh, they, they had so many hatreds on the protesters. They started to throw tear gas. And as a result, it only triggered uh, more people coming on the street. And what lasts is that uh, Most of the major roads in Hong Kong, they were blocked by Hong Kong citizens because they felt like they could no longer bear the government acting in this way. But unfortunately, uh, although the Occupy started and it uh, has lasted for 79 days, while well, the government made a limited uh, uh, promises on the political reform. And you can see all this picture, how the police treat the protesters and how, well, uh, uh, people form their own community in those occupied areas. There are uh, a studying area and there are lots of uh, artwork in the occupied area and there are also lots of tents. And some people might also, well, play tennis on the street. Uh, so it almost came to the end. It's like uh, after uh, 30 years of struggle and the umbrella movement, uh, there were there was another paradigm shift on struggling. Well. People in Hong Kong, they start to think that if they want a better future, they have to make more sacrifice. Not only the older generation, but also the youngest. Too. They are willing to get into prison so as to, well, uh, 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 propel the progress of democratic reform. And that's how, although there were clearance uh, in different uh, occupying areas, people start to think that there were more hope in the future. Because uh, right after the movement, people are more politically active in politics. They would form their own groups. They would have self-organized groups. Uh, they would try to well, join NGOs. Or some people might also were well, going to run for the upcoming election. And that's how the positive energy come. And this might spark change. So what is the most concerned part for Hong Kong people right now is actually, well, three parts. One is that, well, they would like to, well, stop the proposal proposed by the government to be passed in the Legislative Council. The second one is that they have to consolidate the civil society in Hong Kong because most of the people in Hong Kong, they also feel like it would be a long-term battle in Hong Kong. And the third part is that they would have to take a more regional perspective because, uh, 
Hong Kong's problem is no longer only Hong Kong's problem. It is also a problem of Taiwan, of Macau, of China, and the world, because the fate of these places or these regions, they are intertwined or they are interrelated. So only through cooperation with different places uh, and with the civil society in different regions could the progress can really be made. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much uh, for sharing a Hong Kong story with us. Yes, uh, you have done a wonderful job, quickly. So I have to ask two questions, quickly. Uh, how old were you in 1997 when China took over Hong Kong? You? Oh, seven years old. You? Four years old. Okay, last question, but it's not least. Um, what do you want, to, uh, want the international community do to support you? Uh, many people told us that we actually don't have a hope um, to win in this battle against the Chinese government or the Chinese Communist Party because they are just too powerful and just too influential in the world that no one can stop them and no one can put pressure on them. But that's what Alex mentioned, that there is still hope in Hong Kong or there, or there is still, still hope for us that we can still have a change or we can prepare for the change in Hong Kong. Is that um, We believe that the Chinese government is on a very dangerous road and maybe the estate bubbles, the um, economic bubbles will uh, bomb or will collapse one day. And then what will happen at the time, will not, no one will know. And what we can do and what the, co the international committee to do is to keep pressure or keep attention on, a, on the problem of China, on the problem of um, Chinese human rights, on the problem of Tibet, on the problem of China, or Macau, on the problem of Hong Kong, and also Taiwan. Because we, these places are all influenced tightly um, by the Chinese government. And this um, place's fate is hooked tightly on the Chinese. And only um, through um, continuous social movement, continued attention towards democratic movement in Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and Tibet, and China, can we prepare or hope for a change um, in the democratic movement to both in Hong Kong, Tibet, in, and China. Thank you, Lester. Yeah. Just uh, one, uh, half a minute to answer this question. Yeah, we just, uh, to everyone, just don't lose hope, eyes on the prize, and just we have to fight hand in hand, and there a better world will come. Uh, we have to care one another because uh, our fate or our future is tightly connected. If one place is, uh, they, are, uh, they, they, they collapse, uh, it would, well, uh, trigger other places to suffer more. Thank actually, you. actually we have, and when I just arrived here, I truly believe that we have no chance or no space or no right to withdraw hope. Look at what, uh, what are, who are the speakers here. A girl who escaped from North Korea, a girl who escaped uh, from a terrorist um, organization in Nigeria. And then what we are uh, facing or what we are um, handling is just a little dish or a piece of little cake in Hong Kong. We haven't been sent to prison. We haven't been sent to a death row. We haven't been um, become a political prisoner like Dr. Yang B. Oh, you're a yeah. brave young man. So, we, we don't have any chance or we don't have any space to retreat to, or to lose hope. We must stay focused and stay hopeful for the democratic movement or democratic process in Hong Kong. Thank you. I'm personally very encouraged by their message. Their message is very important. I see hope. I see hope. So please, if you can create any international forum for them to speak, do it. So I think wor the world needs to know to understand the story of Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jen Lee, and thank you, Alex and Lester, for a compelling presentation on one of the most uh, major newsmaking uh, situations.